So our next, next and last speaker before the coffee break and before a bit uh, the discussion, if you have any questions, is Richard Baller from the UK, from London, a high-tech person, I think, with you, uh, a partner, a business partner, uh, Stephen Dring. You have uh, launched a business which is called Growing Underground, which I didn't know, but is very known uh, in the UK, where you have... Uh, for fresh produce, uh, converted uh, some of the Second World War uh, um, uh, shelters uh, into a production zone, uh, uh, which serves today most of the uh, big supermarkets, Marks and Spencer and others, but also city restaurants and other uh, businesses. So you will, um, you will uh, uh, give this example as a way not only to grow fresh produce that you uh, market daily and people have at proximity, but also linked with the other presenters on urban architecture, how you can convert uh, uh, a new, uh, in new models some of the uh, uh, infrastructure, industrial infrastructure that uh, we have. So thank you very much for coming from the UK. I know that uh, you are very much business oriented and high tech oriented, so I know that your uh, time is also money. So thank you for coming. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, bonjour. Um, so could we move to the, the first slide, please? <coughs> So, um, so the UN has predicted that we need 70% more food by 2050. That's 70% more food. Um, how are we going to achieve this when only 10% of the Earth's surface is suitable for agriculture and we use a third of that for um, agricultural livestock um, feed? Add to that the average age of a farmer is now currently f uh, 60 years old. Mm. We have a problem. We need to think differently about the future of our food production and um, at Growing Underground we believe in building farms that shorten the distribution cycle for fresh produce to being one of many of these solutions towards achieving this. Growing Underground is an urban farm, it's situated 33 metres under the streets of Clapham, London in a World War II air raid shelter. We use hydroponics and LEDs to produce microgreens which are tiny herbs packed full of flavour. We pack these on site and we ship them into New Covent Garden Market, which is less than a mile away. It's one of the largest, uh, it is the largest wholesale food market, uh, fresh produce market in London. Uh, and from there, our produce is distributed over the capital to various um, food service restaurants um, and, uh, and retailers. We power the site entirely by renewable energy um, and we're working towards um, carbon neutrality uh, a low carbon economy and the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. <clears throat> so um, to sort of put this in perspective, um, uh, there is a diagram and if you can't see it on its slide number four, if we can bring that up. Um, uh, ch -ch -ch -ch. So it just shows the, the outline of the tunnel, it's just a good way of putting this in perspective of what the, the, the size of and shape of it is. So it's a, a deep level shelter. Um, there's two tunnels that are half a kilometre in length. There's about 6,000 square metres of space, which is about 65,000 square feet. Um, there's two lines that actually go above the tunnel. That's actually the northern line, which is the tube network um, uh, within, within London. So they, they, they're above us four storeys. Um, and in the bottom corner, there's a, um, there's a cross section of the tunnel. So it's a round five meter tunnel. Um, and we, there is a mezzanine floor that goes through the center. And we use the top level for um, growing, um, um, growing beds and, and for the farm. And then the lower level for water tanks, pumps, utilities, and that sort of thing. Um, so the tunnels were built between 1940 and 1942. There are a family of seven uh, tunnels stretching from Belsize Park in the north of London uh, all the way through to um, Clapham South in, um, in, in, in South West London. There, each tunnel was designed to house about 8,000 people during the war. Um, and there's this amazing foresight of, of, of when they built them, of um, what to do with them after, after the war. And that's the why they were built in this long linear fashion, um, because the plan was to link them up and have an express northern line um, after the um, express, express tube line after the, after the war. That never happened, they didn't have the money, so, so it didn't, didn't happen. Um, TfL, which is the transport network, um, 
um, in London um, who are our landlords. Um, they inherited the tunnels from the government in the 1990s and they were used for paper storage, document storage, that sort of thing. Um, one of them actually houses, they're used for various other storage things as well, but one of them apparently houses the original Beatles four track recordings in a hermetically sealed box under the streets of London somewhere. Um, so if you can put it onto the next slide, it's um, the one with the benefits, which is six. Slides. six. Um, so we think it's really important to integrate sustainability with business and working towards a low carbon economy. Any business today really needs to think about its impact on the environment. And this is one of the key drivers for us at Growing Underground when we set the business up. So we use a hydroponic system, which is um, a very efficient way of using water. It uses 70% less water than conventional agricultural methods. It's a closed loop system, so anything we put in, any nutrients, stay within that system. With conventional agriculture, that can seep through and, and can cause harm to, um, to local habitats. Um, all of our waste, which is predominantly um, um, our substrate, we grow on a, uh, a recycled carpet, which is um, designed for capillary matting for, for agriculture. Um, it's very similar to the um, method of um, which a lot of us did at school, which was absorbent paper with crest seeds on the top. Um, and um, basically we harvest the product and there's very little we can do with that waste after. So we ship that into um, a site in South East London. It's um, uh, a waste to um, energy um, CHP conversion and it creates energy. And then we use that to offset our carbon footprint. We are working towards carbon neutrality. Anything we purchase for the farm, we tally up um, any product, any service has a carbon embedded in that. And we, we tally that up. And at the end of every year, we create a set of accounts based on our carbon footprint. And um, we, um, we're currently putting together our last sort of four years of that. And we're looking to offset that with um, um, reforestation product projects uh, within the UK. Um, we also power the site entirely by renewable energy. So we use a company called Good Energy that uses 100% um, solar, wind, and some hydroelectric. We get that across the grid, but anything that their customers use, they make sure they've got the infrastructure in place to, to provide that. <clears throat> um, we think it's really important to reduce our impact on climate change, but for a moment, regardless of climate change, the slipstream benefits of a low carbon economy are attractive in their own right. It's much more, um, it's, it's cleaner, it's quieter, it's safer, but most of all, it's much more efficient. But the main reason we set up Growing Underground was to produce hyper-local food, supplying food for the city from within the city, reducing food miles and um, reducing distribution models, pollution, and, and food uh, waste, uh, producing the product within the, uh, a shorter um, distance to customers obviously reduces that. And, and also um, uh, this uh, method um, <coughs> promotes um, food scarcity and, um, and, um, um, with, within the capital. Um, so growing in the tunnel is actually a very efficient way of growing. Um, it's uh, got a year-round temperature of about 15 degrees. Um, all of our micros require about 20 to 25 degrees. Um, so as well as producing um, light, our LEDs produce heat, and that brings the temperature up to um, a suitable level. And with air ventilation at both ends of the tunnel and air movement within the tunnel, we can create the optimum temperature, humidity, CO2, and airflow. Um, we, um, uh, t to enable us to grow in the same optimum conditions, uh, optimum conditions year round, um, and um, we don't use any pesticides either. <clears throat> so I want to talk a little bit about the business. So the business was established in 2012, um, and this is our one of our early sort of um, test areas that you can see on the screen. Um, so um, we spent a lot of these early days negotiating a lease with our landlord, TFL, which was a, a, a long 20-year lease and a long process to put that in place. It was a space that hadn't been used for a long time. Um, we also spent a lot of time negotiating with local councils um, around, uh, so uh, within the UK, we've got a, a business rates where you pay per 
square footage or square meter that could be very high on 65,000 square feet so uh, we spend a lot of time with the local council um, HMRC or the VOA which is the valuation office that's run by the um, um, HMRC and it is, is a tax uh, and we, we wanted to achieve an agricultural exemption um, to, to do this um, it, the business wouldn't have been viable without that so we spent a lot of time in those early days pushing that through um, we um, then we um, we tried and tested um, on a small scale system that you could see on the picture before, um, but um, that, yeah, um, that was our first harvest, um, first test. Um, we sent all that product off for for testing, check there was nothing dangerous in the environment, any heavy metals or anything like that. Everything came back fine. So we moved on to the next phase, which was the picture we were on before. Um, and that was our sort of phase two. And there we, we, we uh, implemented a proper hydroponic system and we started doing um, yield trials, uh, seed density trials. There was, um, it's, microgreens are quite a new business and so none of our competitors were gonna hand that information over to us. So we had to do all that ourselves. Um, we also used this space to attract investment and we brought um, various investors, the early days banks and, um, and angel investors. Um, the banks weren't lending any money at the time, they still aren't really. Um, and um, angel investors, this was quite early for them, but we eventually embarked on a, a crowdfunding campaign. And in our first round, we ended up raising £650,000 um, um, uh, based on the idea at that stage and, and just this area. Uh, and that enabled us to um, from that we actually got a lot of press and a lot of interest from around the world and a lot of investors from around the world which helped and um, we um, we then started to plan and build the farm um, and how we we're going to um, uh, design the, the, the system to, that we, we ended up using so um, by sort of 2015 we did we did that build um, and 2016 we started to supply into New Covent Garden Market, which is food service, which is just less than a mile down the road from where we are. Um, and then 2017, just the beginning of last year, we started to supply into the retail market. So we're now supplying Acado, which is an online um, uh, supermarket in the UK, as well as Farm Drop, um, which is a, a locally based London based uh, online company. Marks and Spencer is one of the largest retailers in, in the UK. Um, um, and uh, we are also supplying Whole Foods and Planet Organic, uh, which are smaller supermarkets within London. Um, we are planning to go into a new supermarket in the next three weeks. So um, we are we're currently using about 20% of the space within the tunnel. Um, as I said, we've got 6,000 square meters, so uh, we're using a, a small section of that area. And the plan is to scale that up um, over the next year and, and, and uh, build into the rest of the tunnel and try and um, uh, make some efficiencies with um, with some automation. Um, uh, currently, it's quite a, a manual system that we're using. For example, we're using salt shakers for seed distribution, um, and um, we're using large knives for cutting that we get cut uh, for, for harvesting. That will all change to a sort of a semi-automated um, system. Um, of course, we are not going to solve uh, world hunger by selling microherbs to high-end retailers, um, but we do believe this is one small step on the journey to achieving that. In the grand scheme of things, LEDs and uh, controlled environment agriculture are in their infancy. In the future, we're going to see um, that exponential growth in efficiencies in LEDs. Uh, we're going to see light recipes tailored for, um, for seeds. Um, and, and technology and hydroponics and uh, in general will see a change. The real game changer though is when we have a, um, an abundance of cheap renewable energy and um, we can start to produce staples. Um, all types of vegetables, but staples such as wheat, soy, maize. I mean, this is this is a long way off. This is you know uh, in the future, but I think this is perfectly possible with the, the exponential growth in technology. And then you'll see us or various people building large vertical farms on the outskirts of major conurbations and supplying those um, those, those conurbations and allowing threatened agricultural land with soil degradation and, and rainforest to replenish and return back to the natural form. Um, Hopefully this combination will see us, um, will help us on the path to creating that 70% more food required by 2050. Thank you very much. Thank you.